Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest today, I want to give a shout out to my sponsors at Blue Chew. Blue Chew is the discreet online service that delivers chewable tablets with the same ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. And if you use code Holly, you can try it for free. Just pay $5 in shipping. Go to bluechew.com and use code Holly to try it today. All right, so now on to my guest. She had a bit of a rocky journey as she navigated getting into the adult industry, but she is now thriving as a performer, and I'm so excited to hear more about what made her the woman she is today. Please welcome Lotus Baum. Hi, Holly. Hi. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. I'm excited to be here. I know. It's so, I was saying when you first came in, you know, I've been following you on Instagram for a long time, and honestly, not to, you know make you feel special or anything. <laughs> but I like don't follow that many people on Instagram. I'm really? pretty picky about it. Okay. Uh, but I follow you and I've just been seeing your photos for so long yeah. and, you know. And I've me s- like developing yeah. as an artist. Because yeah. I do see myself as an artist. That's Absolutely. how I actually started in the industry was with modeling um, for just personal reasons. Mm-hmm. And doing it for the art, Mm -hmm. and then it just developed into going into the adult industry, Mm -hmm. and then I was able to monetize it. And yeah, so we're going to get into all of that. There's a a lot that goes into it. Yeah. I mean, I kind of want to hear about your journey from the beginning. So if you're okay with it, maybe tell me a little bit about like what life was like for you growing up and obviously then how you transitioned into the career that you have now. Okay. So I started off with having very strict parents you know, the typical Asian, well, and my father was military, so very strict. And when I hit 18 and I left home, I just went wild. I rebelled. I went to college and I was just hit the ground running and didn't look back. And I didn't finish college, went to hair school. And while I was in hair school, I started working part-time at a strip club because I was super curious about the industry. I was like, okay, I'm noticing guys are looking at me. I know I'm hot. And I just had this attraction to it. And my girlfriend hit me up and she was living in Miami and she was a stripper and she told me how much money she was making. And once I heard that, I was like, I'm out. I'm out. I'll see you later. Mm -hmm. I told my parents, I'm leaving in two weeks. I packed up my car. I drove to Miami. I'd never even been to Miami. And when I showed up, lo and behold, she had a pimp. And I was unsure about it at first. You know, it was shocking because she did trick me into the situation. But there was, I just was not going to look back. I was like, no way in hell I'm going back to South Carolina. So I just took the cards that I was dealt and I just went with it. And it wasn't as bad as people think it is. I think, you know, there is a part of like pimping that people like hear about and it's like sounds horrible and abusive and everything. But actually the situation wasn't, it wasn't like that really. I mean, yes, he was taking our money, but I did it because I wanted to be, I wanted to learn the, the industry. I came from being raised in the suburbs, like this innocent, naive girl who knew absolutely nothing about sex, escorting, stripping, none of that. Didn't even know girls were making money off of that, really. Um, and then, so I learned all of that through um, the pimp I was with. And then I had two sister wives. And... Um, Once I learned all of that from them, that's when I did leave about like seven or eight months later. Um, I didn't stick around because it wasn't the, like with the girls, with the sister wives, they were a little bit competitive. And when I mean competitive, it's like who's bringing home the most money. So it just was never, didn't really feel like a tight, like knit family, which it's supposed to be like. Um... And that's why I eventually ended up leaving. Also, because, I mean, I wanted to keep my own money. So I'm curious because, so you said that she had a pimp. So she was not just stripping. 
Yeah, so she because we, like a stripper, I've yeah. never heard a stripper having a pimp, but that's for the extracurricular activities. Yeah, she was so doing. actually, the strippers do have pimps too. So it's I think it can go both ways. It's I don't think it's just one category. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, so yeah, we I was a stripper, and then I also was escorting on the side. Mm-hmm. Plus, the strip club I was in wasn't exactly. You know, they didn't follow the rules, so a lot of things could go down. Mm-hmm. You know, I won't name. I won't room. name. Yeah, I won't name yeah. the strip club, but yeah. I'm sure if you know Miami, you'll know which strip club this is. Right. And so, you know, I was doing a lot of bad things in that club, and um, yeah, I went from being like this innocent Asian girl to being like the wildest thing. I was like lost my mind, you know, in in the best way, and then you know, obviously not not the best way. But it was it was a lot of fun, honestly. So I'm curious, like, what's the difference then between a pimp and a manager? So I guess a manager, it's like he's only taking a certain percentage. There really actually isn't much of a difference. Yeah. It's it's interesting that you bring that question up because when I look at OF now, right? Uh-huh. And they have these managers and these yeah. agencies. Yeah. Actually, some of them are pimps and they actually apply the same kind of knowledge to these agencies. So in a way, these these managers and agencies are in a sense pimps. I guess pimps are essentially just managers that work in the sex but, industry, exactly, right? Exactly. And it's kind of a derogatory term towards managers that work in the. I mean, when I, whenever I think of the word pimp, I think of somebody who's abusive. Yeah. Somebody who takes most of the mm-hmm. girl's money. Mm-hmm. Somebody who forces them to be dependent on them. Yeah. But that could also be just a super shady manager. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> no, that's why it's I'm glad you brought that up because it's it's so similar in a yeah. lot of ways. Of course there are situations where girls are in abusive situations. I wasn't in a situation like that. Um I could in a way I would say pimping isn't completely negative because some of these girls are super lazy and they actually need like a guy or someone to push them to go to work. Otherwise, most of them just don't work and and don't do anything. So there are some pros to it. I mean, especially if you are keeping part of the money because every situation is different. Some pimps will take all your money. Some pimps only take part of your money. So you're kind of working like a team. And it's just like the agencies, they're mm-hmm. taking part of the money and then they're pushing the girls to work, right? So it's kind of a fine line there, Yeah. right? yeah. I'm curious about the extracurricular activities in the club. Like, when was the first time that you were introduced to such an opportunity? And was it a surprise? Were you expecting it? How did you feel about it? How did you feel afterwards? So when I first started out, the first club I went to, they didn't have those kind of extra extracurricular <laughs> extracurricular activities. You like my <laughs> you like my secret Sorry. word for it? Sorry. Yeah. And so the second club I went to. My girlfriend did tell me that this goes down. And at first, I was really nervous about it. Did you feel like you had a choice to do it or not do I it? I did feel like I had a choice. Okay. I Everything that had happened at that point when I was with the pimp and with my sister wives was all my own choice. I don't regret a thing. Like, everything I learned was, it all started from that moment. And I wouldn't know what I know from all of that. So, um, it definitely was my decision. And... I loved it. I I mean, yeah, it was a lot of sex going on. Um, but um uh, I I love what I do, honestly. Yeah. I, I don't do that anymore. Um, OF is what changed the game for me and mm-hmm. like put me in more of a power position. But at the time I was super happy with where I was at. I was making so much money. I was I, I was meeting so many people from around the world. I mean, I Felt super sexy and hot and, you know, so powerful, honestly, walking yeah. around naked, not caring and and just super confident in myself. Like this was definitely like a big change for me as a woman. Like I went from being a, li- like a young girl to being a woman at yeah. this point in my life. It's always so interesting to hear everybody's story because it's so different for everyone. Like people can have on paper, the same experience, but have different reactions to it. So, you know, so often the narrative we hear is that you had this experience and you felt exploited and you felt dirty and you felt, Mm -hmm. and you felt 
like you had no power. Yeah. And then there are other people like you who yeah. it's like they had the opposite mm-hmm. reaction from it. So it's it's just really interesting and just shows you how it's all about the individual. Exactly. Because I think a lot of people, when they see a girl like me in this industry, they think, oh, she came from such a traumatic situation mm-hmm. and they're ready to hear just these horrible stories. But I'm different, I guess. I don't have like anything horrible that really like made me this person. I don't have um, any crazy past uh, situations. Like, yes, I've been in some abusive relationships, you know, maybe that, you know, that could be some negatives in there, but there's nothing that really damn. I mean, I'm not a damaged soul, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yes. Like, I feel like people always assume that girls that work in this industry are damaged souls. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I'm actually far from that. Yeah. Like I'm, I love what I do. I get excited about it. And yeah, just, I, I'm a good person, you yeah. know, a good soul. I have a question about escorting. I was actually having a conversation with somebody about this yesterday and I was kind of telling them about how so often it's so different than what people imagine it is. And I was telling him, you know, so many times I've heard from girls that like the sex is almost like the smallest part of the relationship. Yes. It's like maybe a five minute thing. And mm-hmm. the rest of the time is like hanging out, going to dinner, yeah. like just having someone to spend time with, knowing that there's no strings attached and yep. wanted the company of like a beautiful woman. Like what was your experience like with that? Um well, definitely a lot of money and uh, it, every situation was different. You know, there was situations, like you said, where it's just time um, and and a friendship, right? And then there was times where it was just about sex that usually just lasted for like three minutes and then, you know, that was it. Um, so every situation was different because I also had like sugar daddies, a mm-hmm. few sugar daddies in my life and that was like relationships that they wanted, you know, and it wasn't really about sex. It was just about having that friendship. Um, so every situation is is different. Did you ever um, feel like you really had a genuine connection or even just a genuine friendship with people, with guys that you escorted for? Or did it feel very transactional all to the time? To be honest, <laughs> I mean, I'm a great actress. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't always uh, super genuine. I'm yeah. just, I was really good at being an actress because, you know, these guys were older and boring, yeah. you know, and I'm the one entertaining them. So yeah. it's like, it, w- it felt like a job. I yeah. mean, it definitely I mean, was it a is job. a job, right? It is. It was, I'm uh, entertaining them. I'm, yeah. you know, having to be on point, you know, dress up for them. Their lives are boring. They need something exciting. So I definitely felt like a job. You know, I even had a sugar daddy who would annoy me all the time. He would, if I, I would tell him like, I'm, Hey, I'm about to get a massage. I'll be like, it's a two hour massage. I'll be back. I would come back from my massage and have like 30 missed calls. He would have his son calling me too. Like what? he was nuts. Oh my gosh. Yeah. His son calls you? Yeah. He would have his like family like calling me. It was so weird. This guy was. Did his son know what your relationship was I, like? With I him? don't know if he knew that we, just, I think he thought it was my girlfriend. So right, he right. thought I, uh, that we were and girlfriend and boyfriend, which we weren't. Like, that's what I was saying. It's like, it, it was a facade, you know, right. on my end. You know, obviously I did a good job of making a it feel that way. Yeah, actually. And he spent a lot of money on me for sure. But it at the end of the day, I think I spent maybe eight months with him. Um, I couldn't handle The money was so good, yes. But my peace of mind was yeah. worth more. And so I had to tell him to go actually. Yeah. How was that breakup? It was pretty bad. Yeah, um, I can imagine. Did his son call you yeah. to yell at you about it? <laughs> he didn't, but um, he was always saying he he was going to buy me this or that, right? He's We went car shopping at Bentley, and, and he didn't buy me the car, so then he let me drive his Mercedes SLS, right? Which was awesome, but I'm not dumb. I'm like, okay, you're letting me borrow a car versus yeah. buying, you know? Yeah, yeah, like. Yeah. You learn stuff after a while. You know, when I first started in the game, it's like, oh, you're like, oh my God, I'm driving this car. And you're like, no, he, once he breaks up with you, he's taking the car, you know? So I got upset with him. I I, I remember I finally just got to this point where I was like, you keep playing games. Like we went to three DMVs and trying to get the title. And he was like trying to play me. I saw that the title was in his mom's name or something. It was crazy. And so then I was like, I'll meet you at the restaurant. I go to my apartment. I don't answer the phone. 
And then he calls the cops on me. And the cops show up at my door and they're like, he wants his car back. And I was like, here's his car. I was like, I don't want to be with him anymore. Oh my God. Like, yeah. So he would, didn't take me breaking up with him very, very like. Wait, well. hold on. The cops actually showed up to your door and yeah. were like, hey, we did they come and say like you stolen a car? They were saying, oh, he said that you're trying to take his car, which I never said that. He was just trying to start drama, right? You know, he wanted like he he just was so obsessed like with drama and wanting me. He loved me fighting with him. He loved me telling putting him down. He loved me. Maybe just, he needs like, a dominatrix. He told, like he <laughs> he was super into that. Yeah, okay. me like putting him down and just just the drama. Yeah. So I was that's why I had to let him go because I was my life was, was just not peaceful. He was always disturbing the peace. Yeah. And so I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I'm like constantly having to just start drama with you because you love it so much. Yeah. And I was tired. Yeah. yeah. The money wasn't worth it. He could, even though he didn't get me the car and stuff, he did give me lots of gifts, lots of money. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But it just wasn't worth it. You know, no. sometimes you just, it's just not worth it. It's like working like a really high paying job that you fucking hate. Exactly. You know? Yeah. It's pretty much the same thing. Yep, exactly. So going back to working at the strip club um, with your pimp or manager, however you mm -hmm. want to call it. So you mentioned your sister wives. Can you explain kind of what that means and, you know, what that competitive nature was between you guys? Okay, so yeah, two sister wives. And those are just and other girls that are also working. Yeah, they're for this also guy, working. Right? They okay. were both strippers and escorts as well. Right. And one of them was the main girlfriend, mm -hmm. main sister wife. She they in their terms, it's called the the bottom bitch. I hate saying that, but yeah. that's like the slang for it. It's, so were you guys sleeping with this guy too? We we I did a couple times, okay. but honestly, it wasn't really into it. Like mm -hmm. it was more of a transactional relationship. Mm -hmm. And I was saving, like I wouldn't give him everything. I would just kind of give him like a cut of what I was making so I could save money to leave. So mm -hmm. I always had plans to leave. Did he know that you were doing that? No, he had no idea. Like, Was when, it easy for you to hide that? or It was he... wasn't actually that easy because okay. he had such high expectations of me making so much money all the time because in the beginning I wasn't smart and wasn't doing that. I wasn't yeah. like, you know, and then Played I was like, then I started smartening up and I was like, well, one day you have to leave, you yeah. know? So then, so then that's why it was a little bit tough trying to like skim all the time. But, um, yeah, eventually I was able to like save up enough and then and leave. And but what sucks is that when I did leave and what gave me a little bit of the power like to leave is I started dating a guy and then the guy told him that the situation I was in and then he was like, oh, let me be your knight in shining armor. Captain save a hoe. Captain save a hoe. <laughs> and then so basically I went from the pimp situation into dating this guy who actually ended up being abusive. So it wasn't that best situation. And I stopped working. Um, I stopped stripping for him because he's like, oh, I'm going to take care of you. And this was another life lesson for me. It took me twice to learn this, though. I won't lie. It took me two different relationships where they were like, I want to take care of you and I don't want you to work. So I stopped stripping. I stopped escorting, of course. And then, you know, things didn't work out. And guess what happened? I was thrown out on my ass, you know, mm -hmm. with zero, you know. So that's why I'm not afraid to like ever start over or, you know, have to do things over again because I've been through it, you know, like, and that's also why I don't rely on a man anymore. I learned, it took me twice, two times to learn that never ever stop working for a man, yeah. no matter how much money, don't, whatever passions you have, whatever job you have, keep that going. Don't ever stop anything for a man because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. You never know if he's going to like find another girl or just be not interested anymore. And then you're just left with nothing. And I have so many girlfriends that that's happened to as well. Yeah. I'm definitely all about that. I've, my career has always come before like any. Yeah any guy ever. Same. And uh, I think also just besides the the monetary situation and the independence, I think that having your own thing, whether it be a career or a passion or something, also gives you that mental independence too, which is helpful because yeah. the one thing that I've found is that people, I know you're going to laugh, I'm going to get comments about this, but like the one thing that makes people happy is having a sense of purpose in their life, right? Yes. Like contributing to something. Of so course. if you're literally not working and, you know, 
I understand that there's stay at home moms who are like providing for their family and like their kids. Like I get that that's a hundred percent of purpose and a job, but if you're just living to make some other man happy, happy. that's kind of, you know, yeah. And then I feel like people could be like, oh, so stripping is your purpose? Yeah. Like, maybe it is. It is, yeah. Okay, yeah, everyone's got definitely. a different purpose. I actually enjoyed it. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're and making people happy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you're independent. Yes. At the end of the financial independence. That gives you power. That, yes. You know, and that when a man tells you to stop working, when they take your financial independence, they take your power. Mm-hmm. So I would prefer have being a stripper than being told what to do by a guy and have nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And live day to day for him, you know, you're just lost. Yeah. What know? do you think of that whole trad wife? Oh, uh, well, I mean, um, like you were saying, the so for some women, having a purpose of being a mother is mm-hmm. a job. And, and yeah. so I actually do respect women that. Have, but what about if there's no kids? Okay, then that's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> I guess probably most, I mean, part, part of what makes a traditional wife is probably also having children, I, right? Yeah. Because if you talk about tradition, exactly, then yeah. I was just thinking about when I first saw that trad wife, um, you know, thing come up, it was like on some Instagram reel and it was this woman who like loves to like do her hair and like cook her man a <laughs> meal and like do this whole thing. And I mean, I guess that's a purpose too, right? And I mean, if there's no kids involved, I do think it's a little bit odd. Yeah. Because then you're just living for him in a sense. It is hard to just live for one person. Mm-hmm. At least your your children are your children. You've made these people, you've brought them into the yeah. world. You're responsible with bringing them up mm-hmm. and, you know, making them into like a contributing member of society. Yeah. So there's definitely a difference there. Yeah. So I, I think with no children, I'm like, eh. Yeah. Okay. There's also a lot of fucking work, and I can say that as somebody who has a three-year-old. <laughs> exactly. That's Jesus why I respect, Christ. <laughs> that's why I have respect for the ones with kids. I'm like, that is a full-time job. 100% a full-time job. I'm like, do you get sleep? I'm like, I wonder. Do I look like it? <laughs> no. No. So you started modeling, and you said that your first implied nude shoot was what changed it all. What was the shoot for, and what do you remember from that day on set? Okay. So yeah, while I was stripping, I started an Instagram and started modeling just for myself. No one was paying for me or anything, just for passion, just because I felt hot and I want to show the world. And I started with like bikinis. And then my first implied nude shoot was at the beach. And I do remember exactly. And I don't, I remember it just felt so natural. Like I, I, remember being like, oh, well, I'm naked. Like, okay, I'm just going to go with it. And, you know, I would do like shots like, you know, where I'm just like covering myself and then a couple shots where I didn't. And then I would just um, censor it because this was when Instagram was n- not, they didn't have as many rules. Mm-hmm. Back. Do you remember that? I do. Yeah. I do. So this now, is when I was you can't getting, even show butts on Instagram yeah, anymore. I was getting like, away with everything. I would, I would put like the heart emoji. I would like have my legs spread and put like yeah, heart that. emojis on my tits and, nope. and my pussy, you know what yeah. I mean? And just like, so I was posting stuff like that. Like I, I was crazy, you know, it was wild um, because I wasn't monetizing it, but I created a fan base from that. I think at the time I had around like 300,000 fans. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was from just me purely modeling for free and giving out free content in a sense. Um, and then that's what led into the OF mm-hmm. was from the the modeling. And then when um, I was working at the strip club, COVID hit. And when COVID happened, the club closed and I had money saved and everything. So I was comfortable for a few months. And then after a few months, I was just like, okay, like, what am I doing with my life? Like, Yeah, because none you, of us expected it to last that long. Yeah. I remember when COVID hit. I said to my husband, I'm like, there's no way that they can like close down things for more than like two weeks. And my, my husband, call, somehow he always knows. He called it. He's like, oh no. He's like, it's, this is going to be like a year yeah. or more. And I'm like, get the fuck out of here. And he was fucking right. Yeah, he was totally right. Crazy. So I did jump back into work though quicker than that because I love to work. I love hustling. I just love money. So three months into being free because actually I used to work so much. I used to bust my 
ass like in the strip club and not even see daylight because the club I was working at was a 24-7 club. Mm -hmm. So I would go to work at midnight and get out of work at like 8 Mm a.m. So I never saw daylight. So then when COVID hit and the club closed, it was basically a vacation for me for three months. I was living life on the yacht like every weekend because Miami was totally different than the rest of the world. Yeah, Florida. Oh my gosh. There was no rules. We were on the yacht all the time. We were out. Like I had a friend who literally moved to Miami because of that. Yes. So actually a ton of people came at that time. So then I was like, well, what am I going to do now? You know, I partied enough for three months. You know, it's been awesome. I actually like got into like the best shape too. I remember I was, I was really happy. Um, Then I had, I was sitting on 300,000 fans, followers, excuse me, on Instagram. And I was like, okay, well, everyone's pushing me to start OF, you know? I'm like, what is this? I'm like, I'm already posting myself basically nude. Mm -hmm. Why don't I just start OF? And I was actually dating a, a... my pandemic partner mm-hmm. at the time. And he was all about it. And he kind of did help me have the balls to to do to do OF. And him and I started making content together. And uh, what was holding you back? Because you were already like stripping, right? So you yeah. were already naked in front of people. Yeah. So what what was I'm what not was really the hesitation? Sure. I'm not really sure to be honest. Okay. I, I don't I think maybe I just didn't really think about it. I guess it was so it's like it was alien to me because I'm just mm-hmm. so used to being in the club for so many mm-hmm. years and this is what I knew. And this, mm-hmm. you know, in the internet world, it's like I was doing the modeling and stuff, but I didn't really truly understand the power of it and like marketing online and everything because, yeah, when I started my OnlyFans, it actually naturally just happened that I had all of the marketing and that's why it took off for yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah, That and also anything on the internet's forever, right? Yes. And then the strip club, it's, you know, <laughs> not. It's well, not. I mean, maybe it is. Exactly. So it is a big a, jump. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that's maybe what it was. It could have been like me thinking like, do I want to put this like out? Because this is not just implied nudes. Like this is actual videos, yeah. you know, like you can only get so far with pictures. Like, yes, you can sell pictures, but you're not going to make the type of money that girls are making that are selling videos. Yeah. No. So how did your OnlyFans journey begin and where did it lead? So when I started it, it, it took off with me and my pandemic partner. Mm-hmm. And then him and I broke up after like three or four months. It did not last long. Um, and then I got scooped up by CJ Miles. And I stayed with her for a little while and it didn't really work out because I ended up opening my Twitter one day and my OnlyFans and then, you know, she was plastered all over it. And then I go on her Twitter and OnlyFans and I'm not, this was actually when OnlyFans didn't require tags. Mm -hmm. So she didn't tag me on anything. And so then that really like, just like really hurt me. I remember Mm -hmm. at the time I just was just like, wow, like I thought she was my friend. And so then I left working with her and I felt so lost um, because I felt so alone. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, it's so hard to have like friends and a support system in this industry, you know, like even in the strip club. So like I thought things were going to be different when I came into OF world. And really it was no different. Like all the the people that were wanting to be friends with me or work with me, was it, it wasn't to be my real friend. Like it was because of my status, you know, my brand. And then, you know, I, at, when I, um, was with CJ too. I was dating a really rich millionaire at the time too. So like these girls just wanted to basically just like be around my me and be around my very rich ex, you know, at the time. Mm-hmm. And so it just it just made me realize like you really that you can't really have friends in this industry. It's you got to be careful. Do you have friends outside the industry, or are you still having a hard time? Like it's it's, it's that's a good question. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. What I do for a living is not for everyone. It does affect my personal life. It does affect my dating life. You know, basically doing OnlyFans cuts out like a huge portion of availability, you know, like what guys are available to you. You have to find a guy that's okay with it. And 
I'd say it's like 50-50. Like 50% guys are okay with it and 50% of guys are not okay with it. And uh, it so it makes it definitely tough in the dating world. Knowing that, like having had that experience with connecting with other people, do you feel like, do you regret any of your decisions or do you still feel like you made the right one? I still think I made the right one. Um, it it had not only just in dating, also friendships with girls. It's like it 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 makes it difficult to have friendships as well. But I've learned at the end of the day that we're really just by ourselves, you know, right? We're just it's like almost like every man for themselves in a sense. I do have some friends, but I am mostly alone, it's just like me and my partner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, so you have a partner? Um, sometimes. So, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Got, oh, gotcha. When you have a partner. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. So, and I'm, I've learned to be okay with just myself because I've just been hurt so many times because of my brand beca- being used, you know, it's it uh, that I've just kind of almost stopped trying to be honest and everything is just for me as business in a sense. But I mean, you're young. Yeah. And there's so many people out there. Yeah. And there's so many opportunities to like meet the right people in your life, you know? I think right now I'm happy with just my family. Like I have a twin and an older sister and I'm super close with them. And so that I'm super close with my family. And so I think that is what has kept me afloat through all of the BS that I've been with, with through all with these mm-hmm. people and um, that have hurt me and used me and stuff. Um, so is really, my family. So I've, you're not alone. No. So basically, you're right. I'm not yeah. alone. You know, I, I have I'm, my family. I'm the same way. I have some friends, um, but I don't have like a ton of really close friends. And yeah. for me, like it's it is really about my family. Yeah. Like my sister in law. Mm-hmm. You know, my sister, my mom, like. My husband, like, yeah, for me, like, those are the closest people that I have. And as long as I have them, like, friendships are fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wouldn't say that, you know, any, I'm, I'm closer to anybody than I am to my family. Yeah. And family is like, that's like the ultimate relationship, right? Yeah. Because that like doesn't change. Change that's ever. Like, they keep me grounded yeah. and they're not going anywhere. They put up with my BS and yeah. they put up with my drama and my yeah. ups and downs. And it's like no one else is going to do it like that with like yeah. my family. You know? I would say you're really lucky because there's a lot of girls that get into the industry that like are estranged from their family yeah. afterwards. So. Yeah. And that's like going back to what I was saying, like a lot of people – think that I'm like, you know, damaged, but I think it's because my family has yeah. stood behind me through yeah. it all. I do have a great support system. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. All right, guys, <laughs> we're going to take a quick commercial break and we will be right back. So stick around. Hey there, listeners. Are you ready to bring back that spark or kick those first date jitters to the curb? Whether you're nervous about making a great first impression or looking to reignite the flame in a long-term relationship, we've got just the thing for you. Introducing Blue Chew, the little blue pill designed to boost your confidence and performance where it matters most. With Blue Chew, you get the same active ingredients as those big name brands, but in a chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Perfect for when you need to perform at your best without the awkwardness of swallowing pills. So imagine this. It's your first date with someone special. You've got the outfit, the reservations, and the butterflies in your stomach. But now you've got Blue Chew on your side. It's easy, discreet, and works fast, so you can focus on what really matters the most, enjoying the moment. Or maybe you've been with your partner for a while and things have gotten a bit, well, routine. Blue Chew is here to spice things up and help you reconnect with that passion that you once had. It's like hitting the refresh button on your love life. Signing up is super simple. Just visit bluechew.com, consult with a licensed medical provider online, and get your prescription delivered right to your door. No awkward doctor's visits, no waiting in line at the pharmacy, just chew it and do it. So whether you're heading out for a first date or reigniting the spark with your partner, Blue Chew is your secret weapon for confidence and performance. Get ready to make every single moment count. And we've got a special deal just for our listeners. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code HOLLY, to receive your first month for free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Hey, guys, we are back. Okay, so Lotus, 
I'm going to ask you the question that I know so many guys yeah. are hoping that you're going to say yes to. Okay. Do you ever plan to shoot studio porn? Probably not. Oh, crushed, <laughs> crushed. Guys, you can't see her stuff for free on no, the tube you cannot. site. <laughs> I mean, it's already, I have tons of leaked stuff. So, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, just Google me. But um, I, do not plan on it. I love being in control of my own brand and mm -hmm. my own videos and content because a lot of it actually is not planned. I mean, well, some of it is. I'd say 75% of the videos I have have happened just like naturally mm. and part of like my just my sex life. Like when I mentioned earlier when I was dating my rich ex, like a lot, we were approached by tons of girls and that just wanted to fuck us, mm -hmm. you know? So it, those videos were just actual, like natural in a sense. Yeah. So that's why I love what I do because it's like, I'm taking you guys on a journey of my sex, like real sex life. Yeah. You know, like this is not like, it's, you know, acting like this is actually me having fun and I enjoy it. And you know, I love having threesomes. I love, I love women. So, you know, but there has to be a dick in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I like, and it's usually like my partner because mm -hmm. that's who I'm most comfortable with. Right. Speaking of dicks, yes. do you have a preferred penis size? That is another question I every do. man wants to know. I do. So I definitely think that girth is the most important, mm -hmm. but if for me, the perfect penis size is around six to seven inches, but has nice girth. Mm -hmm. Anything more, I'm like, ow, because I, like, especially if I'm dating a guy, because if a guy has like eight, nine inch with like girth and I like to have sex. So like, I like to have sex every day. And if I'm having sex every day with like an eight, nine inch girthy dick, my like, my pussy's going to get sore and yeah. it's going to hurt because yeah. I, I did date a guy like that once and I had to like ice, I had to ice myself. Oh, God. And like, I was like, this is too much. And then he ended up being crazy anyways. I mean, <laughs> so it didn't work out, but, um, but it, I mean, it was just too big. It yeah. was like, I can't handle this every day and I like to have sex every day. So yeah. for me, the perfect is like six, seven inches with That's, a good girth. Yeah. As we say, like the boyfriend dick versus the vacation dick. There you go. Yeah. yeah. The everyday dick is the boyfriend dick. The vacation <laughs> dick is like, you know. The once, once or twice. Yeah. Or like sometimes you go out and get like the super large margarita, yeah. but you don't want to drink that every <laughs> night because otherwise you're going to just be so hungover all exactly. the time. Exactly. So how important is that to you? So if you met a guy who was great, um, everything else about it was awesome, but he was on the smaller side, how, do you think that that relationship would flourish or do you feel like that's a bit of a deal breaker? It is a deal breaker. I've tried it. Okay. And I wasn't pleased. Yeah. You know, I mean, there, of course, there are other ways to please a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, I love when a man goes down on me. You could do that for hours. But, you know, what really what comes down to it is his dick. You know, that's the most important for me. And if he can't please me in that way, then after a while, like, because I've been in relationships where I was like, oh, you know, I can let it slide, mm -hmm. you know. But then after a while, I was like, I'm not pleasing myself. Yeah. I'm pleasing him. And and actually, like, when I was younger, I used to be more submissive. So I used to, like, let that slide. Because mm -hmm. I'd be, like, always sucking his dick, always mm -hmm. sucking his dick, you know, like, so submissive. But as I've gotten older, I'm submissive, but I'm more... I've stepped into my power more mm -hmm. to where I'm like, okay, you know, you need to please me, mm -hmm. you know? So it's yeah. like your cock size matters, you yeah. know? It's like you, we're not taking anything less than six, seven inches here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I get it. I mean, you know, at least you're honest about it because everybody's got a different story. And I, I sometimes when girls say that they don't care what the penis size is. I do say guys in the comments going, liar! They're capping. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's that's called capping. Okay. <laughs> They're totally lying. They're just saying that for their fans to feel better. But I'm going to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's different for everyone. I don't yeah. really, I don't really care so much about it. But I also, 
I'm not the kind of person who has sex every day. So okay. So yeah, it yeah. sounds like sex is a so very important sense. part of the relationship for you. Yes, it is very important. Yeah. I'm a very sexual person. Yeah, which makes sense why you love your job yeah, so exactly. much, right? That all yeah. that all tracks. Yes. <laughs> so what is the most ridiculous request you've gotten either in the strip club or maybe like a custom request that you've gotten on OnlyFans? Okay, the most. I, so I was in the strip club, actually. So this would be a request that was the most ridiculous was a guy who asked me to shit on him and fart on him. And I was like, what? I was like, okay. I was just in shock. Never gotten a request like that before. Um, and I was just disgusted, really. <laughs> so you didn't go through with it no, is he, my I, guess. He, I didn't. I, I think that if he were to pay me enough, I might. How much did he offer you? He offered me $10,000, which is not enough. $10,000 is not enough to shit on somebody? No. Damn, girl. <laughs> that is not enough money. We need more money than that. What, need- what, is the, what, is the, what is the dollar amount? <laughs> I need to know. I'm like, um, I might shit on you for like maybe like fifty thousand dollars yeah you gotta be rich like you have to and then like because like i mean that is just that is just you know a little rank you know it's 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 next level that is next level i would ask for more because you know my understanding of money is higher than uh, someone else's Mm -hmm. like a like a normal person you know Mm -hmm. someone may think a thousand dollars a lot of money I don't think $1,000 is a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So that's why I would want more money than yeah. $10,000. Yeah. Like to me, $10,000 is not a lot of money. Yeah. You've, you've stepped into your- Different level. You know how much your shit is worth and yeah, your exa- shit is worth $50,000. <laughs> 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 exactly. Oh my god. I feel I feel kind of like offended. So I had a guy who he would write to me like once a year and I found out that he wrote to a lot of other girls in the adult industry too. But he um wanted to eat my poop. And oh my God, he that's called, on another level. Yeah. He called it toilet treats or scat caviar. He had like very specific names or it was a very well written request, which Whoa. was, you know, that's got my whole, attention. It's a whole niche. And I was just like, I don't think so. Wow. And then he so initially offered me fifteen hundred dollars, mm-hmm. which I said no. Yeah. I well, mean, I don't think there I hope so. Holly. Yeah. I know. And now I'm like, <laughs> fuck, dude, I should have like and and then he was like, well, 2000. And then I said, no. And then he said, look, I'll make this easy for you. I will rent a hotel room, like in a hotel. I will leave the key for you. I won't even be in the room. You can just go in there. I will put out like a serving tray. No with, way. Like, a, yes. Like so a, he wanted it like, he didn't even want it like you to like like on him, like he wanted it on a tray. Well, yeah, he wanted like because obviously I was not down to come and yeah. like shit on him. Yeah. Um, he was like, okay, he was trying to compromise, right? He was trying to like <laughs> negotiate with me. He's like, okay, well, what if I leave out like a bowl for you to no. shit in? <laughs> And, you know, and he was like, I'll have, like, silver spoon. It'll be really nice. Like, this whole, like, tea a tray set up. <laughs> and you can, like, just shit in this bowl. And then you can leave. You never have to see me. And then I'll come in afterwards and I will enjoy your scat caviar. Oh, my God. I think the most he offered me was, like, $2,500. No, and I was like, no, nah, man. He's too broke. You don't deserve your, He does not deserve that. No, he does not deserve your shit. I, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> I now, thanks to Lotus Bomb, I now know that my shit is... Is worth way, way more, more than, than $2,500. I promise. I promise it's worth way more, Holly. <laughs> yeah, that did not happen. <laughs> I bet he wasn't going to eat it. I bet he just like wanted the, the kink was like for me to do it. He probably would have hidden a camera in there or something. Or I'm, like I'm, he'd be in the closet or something <laughs> weird like that. I'm, I don't want to find out, honestly. I'm like, oh. I would have just sent, well, I did consider sending my husband in there to do Stop. Oh, my gosh. This is hilarious. That would have been funny. But even his shit is worth more than $2,500. It totally <laughs> is. I promise you because it's such a fetish, like, you know, like such a yeah. niche that whenever it's like a super fetish, that's when you charge even more. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it's so rare that someone's yeah. going to do that. So that's why you charge more for yeah, it. You yeah. You want like the rarest thing on the menu, you it, get market price. Exactly. And market price is $50,000. $50, okay. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> Learning something every day. <laughs> so you've had a whirlwind of a few years. When you look back on everything that has happened, how do you view yourself and the decisions that you've made along the way? I look back and 
it definitely has been a whirlwind. A lot of downs, a lot of ups, and I am super happy with where I'm at right now. I feel like I've stepped into my power. Um, I've really built a brand I can be proud of. You know, it took me a while to really step into actually understanding my marketing in general. Mm -hmm. I didn't make viral content until this year, actually. I built a lot of followers on Instagram over the years, but I didn't start going viral until this year. How did you get to that viral stage? So I actually got into that from meeting a girl that taught me how to use the pro camera. So everyone's marketing is different. For me, what really got me viral was using the pro camera and using slow-mo. So I started doing these like booty jiggles. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm doing it in 120 frame per second. Yeah. And it's like capturing like the, yeah, yeah, you know? And so that's what got me to go viral. And then um, now every, I do shoot pretty much everything in slow-mo and it's not all booty jiggles, but I kind of mix it all in there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, then my marketing took off this year and my brand took off. I'm making the most money I've ever made. And uh, I'm really happy with where I am at right now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in a good place mentally as well. Like a lot of the downs that I had in my career were when I was partying, I was doing drugs, I was partying. Yeah. Just part too much partying. Yeah. And that's where like my career wasn't doing the best. Mm-hmm. That's because I felt so lost. Mm-hmm. Um, but now I'm like pretty much sober And uh, yeah, I'm just making a lot of money and I'm really happy. I'm working my ass off. I'm shooting like every other day, posting on like 11 accounts right now. I'm trying to get my YouTube channel started. Um, so I'm happy in the direction I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it's only going to go up from here. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest lesson that you've learned over the last few years? Ooh. The biggest lesson that I've learned. Besides that your shit is worth $50,000. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to keep coming back to that. Just <laughs> um, is to, to rely on yourself, to stop looking for validation and and power in other people, mm-hmm. to, 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 to rely only on yourself. And, yeah. and I think that was my issue is I was always, like, like I said before, always trying to be friends with other people, always mm-hmm. trying to find something in other people. But at the end of the day, the power is in myself. My brand is in myself. I don't need anyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, like even with collabs and stuff, like I've gotten to a point where I don't need to collab with anyone. Like I'm, I've created such a huge like brand for myself, you know, that now people are just contacting me all the time. And Mm -hmm. like, I can say no to this and that. Before, I used to just like always be looking for somewhere else, somewhere else, you know, like for my marketing where at the end of the day, I should have just been focused on myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was all over the place. Yeah. And um, what advice would you give to someone looking to get into modeling in the adult industry or stripping or any of the things that you have done? I'd say if you're going to get into this industry, um, you need to love it. Mm. You need to really yeah. love yourself. I yeah. mean, because I I think that what makes it so enjoyable is that I love myself. I think I'm the hottest shit ever. I right. think I want to show the world how hot I am. Yeah, you know, like I'm that confident, and you need to be that confident to be in this world in this industry. Because I get a you know not all the time, but negative comments sometimes here or there, and. I don't really care. Some like I have some friends in this industry, friends in this industry who are always like, oh my God, like this person commented and said that. I'm like, who cares? Yeah. And then if you're not ready for being criticized by people and you're always worried about what other people are thinking, then this is not for you. Yeah. You know, like don't do this if you give a shit what other people think. Yeah. Because I don't give any shits. I yeah. don't care what he or she said about me. I I think that's what makes me so happy at the end of the day is yeah. that I just like live in my happy little bubble. And I'm just like, this is my world, you yeah. know, and you're in, just in it. Yeah. No, I mean, that's so true. I uh, definitely 
pretty much never read the comments. Yeah, I'm like, I, I really, and if I do, I'm just like, delete, lock, you know, just, like, yeah. I don't even entertain it. I'm like, yeah. why, why spend your energy? I know. On I see that? some people, sometimes like, I'll post pictures yeah. of somebody else or an interview or something, and some people will say negative stuff and they'll go in there and they'll start fighting with them. Yeah. And I'm like, why? I, I know. I'm You're like, not going to win. Yeah. And I sometimes will comment, like, if my fans start fighting, I'll be like, play nice, you yeah. know? Like, I try to keep things positive. It's like, if you focus on negative, of course, it's going to be negative. Yeah. Like if you look for problems, you're going to find problems. So yeah. it's like, you know, you just ignore it and then, you know, and just go about your day. Do you, you know? believe like in the law of attraction, like positive energy attracts oh, positive yeah. energy? I definitely believe in that. I mean, I feel like everything that you think and create, a, you it, you manifest it, you know? So like I said, if you're looking for problems, you're going to find them, you know? But if you stay positive, then everyone feels that energy and it, it remains positive. That's why like, um, I don't, I feel like that's why I don't get a lot of hate comments. I, mm -hmm. I, I It's very rare if I do. And I think it's because of the, the energy I put out there is so positive. Yeah. Do you ever, have you ever been in a situation where you found it really difficult to remain positive in that situation? And how did you deal with that? Any type of situation? Oh, I don't think so. Don't You've know. always like found a way to. Yeah, you know. I've always been this way. I've like since I was a little girl. Like my personality has always been so big, so magnetic, mm -hmm. so positive. Um, I've just always had such like a good soul, good heart. Yeah, and like even through all the the bad things that's happened to me in my life, I've always remained like true to myself. Yeah, it's actually like why I got this tattoo. It's like to remind. It's the Queen of Hearts. Can I see it? Yeah, it's oh. it's old, so it looks okay or whatever. But um, um, it's the Queen of Hearts, and that's because I just I wear my heart on my sleeve, and yeah. like no matter what happens to me in my life, like I, it's a reminder to just always stay true to you. Yeah. Right. And don't let just because she did this to you or he did this to you doesn't mean to go and be like them mm -hmm. and, and lower your frequency for them. Right. It's yeah. just to stay true to yourself and always be at a higher frequency and to be a good person no matter what. Yeah. You know? Take the high yeah. Road. Don't don't turn into them. Then you're no better. Right. Yeah. Now that's a, I think that's one of the most valuable lessons that we can have in life. And it's, it's a hard one to learn and it's definitely harder for some people than others. Yeah. Yeah. I've, yeah. I, when I've been in that situation where I'm not thinking positively, I literally sometimes will actually write down gratitude lists. Yeah. And I will do that like on a daily basis yeah. just to change the pattern of thinking. Yes. Because sometimes it takes practice. Just that like physical yeah. writing and journaling and, and, mm -hmm. and, and forcing those thoughts, those yeah. like, those happy thoughts mm -hmm. will actually change, like rewire your brain it, it and your does. thinking. It does, yeah. But you have to like practice it. And, and yes, and it does take a higher emotional intelligence to yeah. understand that. Yeah. Like some people don't even understand how that works. You do have to have a little bit of a higher EQ. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, as like we're talking and stuff, like I can tell you have a high EQ. And it's like some people don't even know what EQ is. And it's mm -hmm. like you should look it up. Um, it, there, there's I, IQ and EQ and like having a high IQ, uh, um, EQ, excuse me, means that you're able to be above what's going on around you. You're mm -hmm. able to think ahead, th you know, no matter what's going on, you're not affected by other people because you are, are just emotionally intelligent enough to understand like, okay, like even though this happened, I like, I know how to maneuver and operate around it and to where I can manipulate it to it works in my favor. Right. I've actually never heard that term EQ before. EQ. And I Emotional was, I was, quotient. Okay. That makes sense. Because I was listening to you say that and I was like in my head, I was like, does she know it's IQ? Do I correct her? <laughs> Someone's going to say something in the comments. No, no, it's, it's EQ. Turns out. I was wrong. I don't know anything. <laughs> no, you know a lot. Stop. <laughs> no, I love that though. That 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 makes sense. I mean, they they say that there who is that Gardner that had the nine levels of intelligence. There's like all these different forms of intelligence, right? And everybody has some yes. form of intelligence. There's you know we generally think of the intellectual mm -hmm. intelligence as yes. being that marker, but you're exactly. right. There's emotional intelligence. Exactly. There's athletic intelligence. Um, I can't remember any of the rest of them because I'm not that smart. Yeah. Um, but you can look it up. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you. I do have one question okay. from a Patreon member for you before we go. Okay. If that's okay. And also, I want to give a shout out and welcome my two new Patreon members, Bobby Manning and Leon Bailey. Thank you guys so much for coming on board and supporting my show. So this question is from Hugo, and he said, how has being Asian affected your career as a model and then as a DJ? Is being a woman helpful to differentiate yourself from most other DJs, or is it more of a challenge in the DJ industry? I know we never even talked about your music yeah, career. Yeah, we didn't. So that the time that I took a break from OnlyFans and I was part of my downed moment in my career, um, I did start DJing and... Um, I loved it, but, you know, with the DJing came a lot of partying and stuff, so it wasn't good for me mentally. Um, being a woman and being an Asian woman as a DJ, it actually does not help you, okay? Uh, it's a male-driven industry, so being a woman really kind of puts you last place. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, like, look at uh, festival lineups and stuff like that, you're not going to see many female DJs. Yeah. Um, you can make it work in your favor, but it always turns into something sexual, you know? Mm -hmm. It's it's Men have so much power in that industry, and they mm -hmm. also do in, in the sex industry as well, you know? It's sad. It's it's the truth. It's sad, but um, it is what it is, you know? But uh, I did notice that, you know, getting, uh, you know, getting booked, it's a little bit harder being a female versus a male. And then uh, his other part of the question is, did you have a stereotypical tiger mom? If yes, how did that affect your life? And do you think a tiger mom is a good parenting style? Can you start off by explaining to those who might not know what a tiger mom is? So a tiger mom is a very strict Asian mother. So I had a tiger mom to the T. I had to practice piano every day and violin. I took math and science classes, and she wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer. I did not have friends. I had to go after school. I had to go to her alterations and dry cleaning. So there you go, more typical stereotypical Asian um, mom, you know, because like she owned a dry cleaning and um, alteration store. So after school, I'd have to go there and help her at work. Then I'd have to go home and do my homework. And I might, I had a, I have a twin. And so my twin and I would never were allowed to like have friends. We were never allowed to. Is she your identical twin? No, we're fraternal. Okay. So okay. she has curly hair and she's taller than me. Um, and we're very different. Mm -hmm. um, like, she would never do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, we put up with a tiger mom for sure. And it really just kicked basically her in the ass in a sense because we did the complete opposite of what she wanted. You know, like, we were like, we don't want to do math and science. We don't want to be a lawyer and anything. So my sister actually does photography and um, I went into modeling and stuff. So we just like went in the total opposite direction of what she wanted. And I, I think it's because she just kept pushing us, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like when you try to push someone, like what do they want to do? They want to do the opposite. Yeah. You know, it's like you're like, oh, don't do this. And then you're like, okay, well, I'm going to do it. Yeah. You know? And so that's kind of like where I was when I was younger. I was immature, you know? And and they, sh my parent, my father was in the military. So like on top of having a tiger mom, I had like a strict father as well, mm -hmm. military father. So they were just always constantly trying to push us to do what we didn't want to do. And they should have given us like more space to explore, I think would have been, you know, a lot healthier for us because once we hit 18 and we left for college, we just went buck wild. Yeah. We just were like, wow, yeah. we're like freedom. Yeah. This tastes awesome. Like, you know, and just like went crazy. So I think that's why I kind of was like late in the game because I didn't get to experience a lot of things that I feel like my other like um, friends were experiencing, you know, at that, at that age. And I feel like it took me a while to like, you know, like 18 was when I first tasted any kind of freedom. And mm -hmm. so I think that's why I was, I took me a while to like mature, mm -hmm. I think. But you said you're close with your family. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming your parents have like accepted what you do now yeah. and yeah. they're fine with it. Mm -hmm. 
And it also seems to me like you have a really good work ethic. Yes. Do you think that you got that from your mom being oh, so strict yeah. with you? So that that's a positive from having a tiger <laughs> mom. It was my mom worked like a horse. Oh my gosh. Because, you know, she came from a third world country, mm-hmm. super poor, right? Where are your parents from? My mom is from Korea and okay. my, my father, he was born in Germany and then was raised in Wisconsin. Okay. So he's American and... um joined the army and met my mom in Korea. And that's okay. kind of like how that went down. Um, but they both worked so hard. And um, I definitely got my work ethic from them. Like, I'm just like, go, go, go. Yeah. Well, I I, I can relate to you on that. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm similar in that way. I definitely got my work ethic yeah. from my mom. She's very uh, type A. Yeah. And I am too. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm I'm grateful for it. Yeah. So again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Holly. This was awesome. (laughs) Can you let everybody know where they can find you online? You can find me on Instagram at at Lotus Bomb with two Bs. And uh, yeah, that's like my main platform right now. And hopefully I'll start my YouTube platform soon. Cool. And then you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on X. I'm on TikTok at at hollyrandall78 and just go to hollylinks.com for links to all of my platforms. And of course, if you want to support this podcast and watch these interviews live and submit questions for my guests, join my Patreon at patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. Thank you guys so much and I will see you next week.